thank you for coming to our presentation today with Dr. Barnes. Um, Dr. Barnes is the Chairman of the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at the University of Incarnate Word, where he teaches a course on social history of the Holocaust and has visited numerous Holocaust sites in Poland and Germany and will soon be visiting Holocaust site in Latvia and Lithuania. And I'd also like to um, thank the Holocaust Museum, Learn and Remember um, Programming Committee for the Library, as well as the Library Foundation for their support of uh, this presentation tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Barnes, thank you. Welcome, thank you. Welcome to all of you. Um, it's nice to see everybody here. I especially want to uh, extend a greeting to my good colleague on the back row, uh, Dr. Uh, Gilberto Hinojosa, Professor Emeritus of History at Incarnate Words. So mm -hmm. Thanks, Gil, for coming. Uh, the theme for this year is Learning to Remember is resistance. And so I thought it might be a good time to make a presentation on the largest and obviously the most uh, important of the revolts, the uprisings, and that's the, what happened in, in Warsaw. So this is on the uprising. Uh, and well, before I get started, I just want to say hi to my good buddy Howie Nestel. Howie's one of the co-sponsors of Learn and Remember, and it's a pleasure to have you here. So, uh, first we locate Warsaw. Okay, Warsaw is kind of in the north central part of Poland, right here. It's just straight north of Radom, uh, a little bit uh, northwest of Lublin, um, and uh, Krakow is down here. Uh, this is uh, the map of Poland uh, as it looked in 1933. Um, this map has changed. The boundaries of Poland today are different than what they were then. Um, Warsaw was indeed uh, the major center in Poland of Jewish life and Jewish culture. Uh, its population of about 350,000 Jews is about 30% of Warsaw's overall total population. Uh, today, sadly, uh, there are very few Jewish residents in, in Warsaw, indeed uh, Poland itself. Uh, as you all know, uh, war began on September 1, 1939, with the invasion of Poland by Nazi forces, and by in four weeks' time, uh, the German army uh, was in Warsaw. They entered Warsaw on the 29th of September. Uh, immediately put into operation a Judenrat, a Jewish council, under the leadership of an engineer named Adam Chernikov. Uh, and within about uh, two months, uh, it was dictated that the Jews must wear white armbands with a blue star of David. Jewish schools were closed, property confiscated, Jewish men put into forced labor. Okay. Here's a picture of Chernikov. If you look closely, you see that there's an SS officer in the back. Um, the Warsaw Ghetto was established uh, after about one year of Nazi occupation in Warsaw. It was established in October of 1940. Uh, all Jews residing in Warsaw and adjacent areas were forced into the ghetto uh, so that the ghetto population swelled to about 400 to 450,000 people in all. The ghetto was surrounded by a 10-foot tall wall with barbed wire on the top of it. It was a very, very crowded, 1.3 square miles total for these hundreds of thousands of people. And that meant that uh, on average, uh, an apartment might have seven, eight, maybe as many as 10 people crammed into one room. Uh, Caloric intake was, was absolutely pathetic. It was horrible. Uh, starvation, disease, death on the streets was a, was a common thing, unfortunately. Um, by mid-1942, roughly about 83,000 people uh, in the ghetto had already died uh, because of starvation. This is, this is a map of the ghetto. And if you allow me for just a second here, I want to, I want to kind of just alert you to a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, you'll notice that the ghetto is separated into what was referred to as the larger ghetto and the smaller ghetto. And it, the two are connected by a footbridge on Schaden Street. 
uh, which enabled then uh, the inhabitants of the ghetto to move from one side to the other as they needed to by going over the footbridge. Uh, but it, with a terrible sense of irony, it also allowed non-Jewish Poles to pass through on Schladen Street and to look into the faces, look into the homes of Jews who were crammed into the ghetto. The Umschlagplatze uh, is up here at the very top. That's the assembly point uh, adjacent to the railroad uh, from which the trains would leave to Treblinka. Uh, one of the six extermination camps in uh, Poland. Uh, very importantly, um, almost all of Warsaw's Jews, when shipped to extermination camp, were shipped to Treblinka. Um, I have students that ask me, well, why, why were all six of the extermination camps in Poland and not in Germany? Because Germany had thousands of concentration camps, war camps, and, and the like. Well, the answer is that a Jew in Germany had a better chance of surviving the war, surviving the Holocaust, than did a Jew in Poland. At the outbreak of the war, about 3.3 million Jews resided in Poland total. By the time the war was over with, that population was down to 300,000. In other words, 3 million of the 3.3 million of Polish Jews were killed. The answer is why the extermination camps, uh, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Kielmno, Soviet War, uh, why they were located in Poland is that's where the bulk of Eastern European Jewry lived, in Poland. So you put the, the ghetto adjacent to the trains, the trains go into the extermination camps. This is a street called Mila Street. Uh, one of the resistance organizations had a bunker on Mila Street. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, the the uh, uh, the great synagogue is actually located right out right here, just outside of the wall proper. Uh, down in this corner of the small ghetto uh, was an orphanage for over 200 children that was run by Janusz Korsak, uh, an educator, pediatrician, uh, writer of fiction, humanitarian. Uh, this is where the Ringo Bloom archives uh, were actually hid. Um, more on that in just a little bit too. And Paviak Prison, uh, which was the head of the Gestapo, uh, was housed right there. So that's the lay of the 1.3 square miles of the, uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto. Here's a picture of the, of the ghetto wall. This is taken from inside the ghetto looking out. So all the, uh, the buses, the trolleys are on are in the non-ghetto part. Okay. Uh, and here's a picture of the bridge over Schladen Street, uh, where workers would often have to pass from their apartments or their homes to wherever it was that they were working. Uh, some a fair amount of people were employed, at least early on, in 1941, uh, in the ghetto. And they were employed doing different kinds of things. I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, this, this bridge um, became somewhat important. This is a picture of, of Janusz Korczak. Quick story about Korczak. Uh, he was a brilliant man and a very kind pediatrician and writer. And, oh, funny. and when German soldiers came, for Korshak's children, about 195 of them, when they finally got there. Um, they were going to take the children, and uh, legend has it that uh, one of the SS officers made, a, made a, an offer to Korshak that he could, um, that he could smuggle him away. He would, he would smuggle Korshak away. And Korshak said, no, I'm, I'm going with my children. I will not abandon my children. And so he dressed the children up, along with his staff, his nurses, and dressed the children up in very nice clothes and gave them toys, and this caravan took off to the, to the train. Korshak was, and all of the children were killed uh, in Treblinka. As time went by in the ghetto, it became apparent that there needed to be some sort of a record of what was going on in the ghetto. And so Emanuel Ringelblum 
decided, Ringelblum, excuse me, decided that um, they would create a, a, an archive. And this became known as the Ringelblum archives. Milk cans and crates were used, and in all, uh, probably about 35,000 pieces of material. Uh, uh, diaries, first-hand accounts, uh, just a, a wide array of material was stuffed into these and other cans and hidden. There are still, it's, the Ringelbaum archives were uncovered in 1946, but not all of them. Uh, there is still a set that has never been found. Speculation is that it resides under what is today the Chinese embassy in Warsaw, but uh, so far it still is in hiding. This is a picture of the Great Synagogue. A really beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, Paviat Prison, the head of the Gestapo, offices there. Paviat, there's what Paviat looked like on the left earlier today, what remains of Paviat. In 1944, uh, the Germans destroyed the prison entirely, reduced it to rubble. There's only just a, a little bit of sections of Paviat that exist today. This is a scene from the Umschag Plaza, uh, the assembly point where people would be loaded on the, on the trains to Treblinka. I want to show you a set of photographs that I think in some ways don't even re be, really need any narration. Uh, Willy Georg was a German soldier uh, ordered to take pictures of ghetto life and he spent one day in the ghetto and took a lot of photographs, about 160 in all. And what follows are some of these pictures. I will make one commentary here. Uh, it is all, this is just a market scene in the ghetto. You see a lot of children uh, in this picture. Uh, some of them, like the little girl over on the right, smiling, the little boy smiling at the camera. Uh, it is entirely conceivable that every single person in that picture Every man, woman, child was exterminated at, at Treblinka. If they didn't die, first of all, from starvation, disease, and, and the like. Yeah. Here's a scene of some men selling rope. Uh, another one. It's kind of interesting about this. Is this is a man who is selling armbands? Okay, selling them for just a small amount of money. But what's kind of striking about this is that some of the status distinctions that existed in the Jewish community between the haves and the have-nots is evident even here in the ghetto. As you can see, the young woman uh, dressed nicely uh, behind the, the vendor. Um, and and it, was, it was the case that you know, some people in the ghetto simply lived better than others, unfortunately. Uh, but these kinds of scenes were what Willie York stumbled onto in his one day there. Disease, death on the streets, starvation, sickness, dysentery, an older gentleman, young boy. Young woman, armband. You see the children looking at her, she's looking at the photographer, some sense of, and, and here we see a couple of young women. Uh, speculation is that uh, these two women were sisters. Death on the streets. As I said, some of the, some of the lucky ones uh, were able to work. Um, by that, they were able to make just to have just a little bit better in terms of food rations. Uh, and at least while they were working uh, and doing something that the Germans considered useful, uh, they were not going to be subject to extermination right then and there. So they got to live a little bit longer. Here's work in a boiler factory, a man making dolls. Uh, uh, men and women both in a sewing factory, making things for German soldiers. And then here's a 
large picture of workers in a textile factory. That gives you an idea of the kind of labor that uh, people in the ghetto uh, were put into. This is big. <laughs> the Grosse Action, Warsaw, 1942, starts in the summer, in July, with the SS communicating to Chernyakov and the Jugendrat that the Jewish population was going to be resettled to the east. That was the big ruse. They were going to be moved out of the ghetto and moved away from military confrontation, be moved to the east. Uh, Chernikov knew that probably wasn't the case. He committed suicide four days after this announcement. And the great action, Rose Axion, uh, goes from July uh, 23 to September 21. People could be crammed, about 100 people in a cattle car, uh, roughly five to 6,000 people every day shipped out to Treblinka. Uh, Treblinka was not a concentration camp. It was an extermination camp, which meant that upon arrival, everybody who was there was exterminated or gassed. And um, in total, during the great action, probably about Estimates run around 254 to 265,000, but maybe some scholars say maybe as many as 300,000 died in this short period of time. In all, at Treblinka, uh, accounts uh, estimates vary, but the United States Holocaust Museum estimates that at Treblinka, about 835,000 people perished. Uh, of course, that's about 1.1 million at Auschwitz, so you can see that Treblinka has a very high death toll, too. This is a, an announcement, a notice that was posted in the ghetto, prominently displayed everywhere. Yes, sir? Have you been to Treblinka? Yes. Yeah, sure it have. It's still there. Huh? It's still there. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, Auschwitz most certainly still is physical space, especially at Auschwitz I. Uh, there were three, three Auschwitzes, one, two, three. And the one that we're most familiar with is actually Birkenau, which is Auschwitz II. Auschwitz I was an old Polish military uh, uh, encampment. And those buildings, uh, the Nazis just took over and just used, and that's still, you go there today. Birkenau uh, got its name from the white birch trees at the back of, uh, of Birkenau, uh, and those white birch trees still stand today. They, they look very beautiful in such a horrible place. Um, the last time I was in Auschwitz, uh, I got up onto the train station. You've maybe seen pictures of the famous train station at Birkenau, and at the top of it is a room about this big with windows all the way around, and it looks out, and my, my first impression was, oh my God, Auschwitz is such an industrial factory. It is so large. You can't see the back wall, the back section of it. It's just absolutely huge. Um, is, is this gives the, you an idea. Is the Warsaw Ghetto still? Uh, is the what? The Warsaw Ghetto, did they destroy it? Oh yeah, it's been completely destroyed. And, um, there's, there's remnants of the wall in Warsaw that still stand today, but you've got to know where they are. Go, go find them. Um, and there's not that much left there. Uh, but the entire ghetto was raised uh, during the revolt. And at Treblinka, I should back up and answer your question as regards Treblinka and what's there today. There's a monument. I'll show you a picture of it in a little bit. Uh, and there's about, there about 18,000 stones, markers, memorial markers, scattered around the grounds where the crematoria uh, actually uh, once was. At Treblinka, today, when the Germans moved out of Treblinka, literally because they had exterminated all the Jews in that particular district, and Treblinka had done its job. So when Treblinka was shut down in 1944, uh, they literally bulldozed the entire place. They destroyed everything at Treblinka. Every building, every post, every barbed wire fence, every watchtower, 
Uh, they didn't really, they had barracks, but you know, not big barracks like at Auschwitz, which was a combination concentration camp and extermination center. So then after they destroyed everything in Treblinka, they brought dirt up from uh, another Treblinka camp, Treblinka 1, and they simply buried the entire area under four feet of dirt. So the archaeological excavations that are going on now are digging down and finding what remains of uh, the crematoria and the gas chambers. But you've you got to go down four feet and work your excavation from there. Do the people there still want to be reminded of it? Did they what? Did they want to be reminded of it or did they want to forget about it? I'm sorry, I'm still not hearing you. Do the people there in that area want to be reminded of it? Or there, well, first of all, Treblinka well, was not in a major population area like like Majdanek. Majdanek is in Lublin. Uh, I mean, it's like right in the middle of the city almost. Uh, but uh, Treblinka is in a very remote uh, spot, far away from from villages, towns, shuttles, communities, and so uh, there was nothing around Treblinka. It existed all by itself. So once. Once the Germans moved out of Treblinka and blew up what remained and buried it under dirt, the forest is reclaiming it. And that is true of the major sections of Treblinka today. The forest is just plain reclaiming it. This gives you an idea of some of the actions um, and the numbers of people who were shipped to Treblinka. The shipments began, of course, with the most vulnerable, uh, those who were homeless, those who were destitute those without any money, uh, no means of escape. People would be brought up uh, by the hundreds or thousands every day, uh, paraded through the streets to the Umschlagplatz, to the transfer point at the railroad, and uh, loaded onto the trains to Treblinka. And it's about 50 miles away, uh, so it, it took you know an afternoon or a morning to, to get there. Uh, and this is a, an outline of what Treblinka looked like. We've had to go back and, you know, kind of refigure and, and reconstruct based on some memories of what the what the camp actually looked like. Two very important things here: the extermination uh, part of the camp was was right here. These are pits where bodies would be uh, buried and burned. Uh, trains would drop people off here. There's an assembly point here and an assembly point here. And this would lead out into the gas chamber. And the Nazis called this the path to heaven. Uh, that was, in fact, the name that they gave to the to those, those places that led into the gas chamber. Not just at the Treblinka, but at Sobibor, Kiamno, other extermination camps. The path. After the big action in Warsaw, about 50 to 55,000 Jews still remained in the ghetto. Okay. And it was pretty evident by the fall of 1942 that uh, extermination uh, was in the cards for everybody. Uh, despair began to give way to resistance. Resistance organizations were formed, and there were two main ones. Uh, but there weren't a lot that, that the Jews in the ghetto had with respect to firearms. Uh, mostly they had to do with, with homemade uh, grenades or homemade bombs, what we would think of as Molotov cocktails. Um, but they very few small arms okay, and no real, well, no, no machine guns or anything like that. Uh, so the resistance was going to be very, uh, very weakly armed. But it, what, what became evident, though, say, uh, during the Warsaw Revolt was that these fighters were going to determine the time and the nature of their own death rather than be dragged to the trains and shipped off to, to Treblinka. And it, it was, from the very outset, it was pretty clear that this was going to be a doomed revolt in, uh, uh, in Warsaw. In January of 1943, uh, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, made a visit to Warsaw and ordered that 8,000 Jews on the, 20th, on the 9th of January uh, be sent immediately. 
Uh, and then the Jews fought back. The residents of the ghetto fought back. Only about 4,500 to 5,000 of that day's shipments of a planned 8,000, in fact, were shipped to Treblinka. And then following the very brief revolt in January, the decision was made by the SS to just suspend deportations until April. And two resistance organizations that took shape in the Warsaw Ghetto. The Zadowska or Gazaka Bohova, uh, which translates into Jewish Combat Organization uh, with the initials ZOB. Uh, that organization was comprised of younger aged people, uh, a lot of students, uh, probably totaled somewhere around 220 fighters in all, no more. Uh, and Mordecai Annalevitz was the head of uh, the ZOB. The Zawski Zizwak was a Kazi, was a Kali, uh, translates into Jewish military union. It was comprised of a lot of former World War I soldiers, Polish soldiers, and uh, was the larger of the two main resistance organizations. About twice as many people, 400 in that organization, the ZZW. And it's, the head of that was uh, a relatively young man named uh, Pavel Frankl. So those are the two resistance organizations. And this is a picture of Anna Levitz. Uh, he dies in the bunker at Mila 18 along with other ZOB fighters uh, in uh, the next month. Uh, as you'll see here in a little bit, the revolt in the Warsaw Ghetto lasts a grand total of one month. <coughs> Start to finish. Uh, and that's a picture of Pavel Frankl. Okay. We don't have any photographs of Frankl, so we have to rely on artists kinds of go back and draw a picture. So here's the timeline, okay? Uh, Jürgen Stroop, the commander of the uh, SS in Warsaw, uh, replaced the previous head, who Himmler had considered to be weak and inefficient. Stroop arrives in Warsaw on 17 April, and the SS enters the ghetto in mass on April 19th. They begin a massive burning, a raising of the ghetto. Uh, eventually, they will destroy every building in the ghetto. Uh, in one act of defiance on the 19th of April, the Polish national flag and the banner of the ZZW is raised on a building, plainly seen by people in the ghetto and people on the other side of the wall. Infuriating to Stroop and to Himmler, uh, but it was up there for four days before the SS finally succeeded in having it come down. That, that picture, uh, and we don't really have a picture of it, but that image of the two flags flying uh, together is a very powerful one today in the state of Israel. It, 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 it means a lot to Israeli citizens. Uh, however, in 10 days, all the ZZW, uh, the Jewish uh, military union, uh, they, they're all gone. Uh, commanders have all been killed. And what few fighters are left uh, flee to the forest. And then the SS discovers this bunker at Mila 18. And uh, that's where Anna Levitz and uh, some other uh, Zob fighters uh, make their final statements and take cyanide and commit suicide. Uh, and then Stroop uh, personally set the, the dynamite to blow up uh, the great synagogue. And shortly after that, sends a report to Himmler about the success. Uh, and in the report, famous line is, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto is no more. That literally uh, was the case. So there are four copies of the Stroop document, okay, four sets. Uh, they were used, well, this one was used at the, at the Nuremberg trials after the war as evidence uh, for the Nazi atrocities against Jewish residents in the ghetto. And what I'm going to show you now is a set of about 
25 or so pictures strictly out of the Stroop report. Okay? Uh, these were taken by documentary units that were connected to the, uh, to the SS, and they just simply photographed the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. Okay? Uh, we start with Stroop himself. That's the general, actually a major general, in the middle, looking upwards. Okay? You can see the buildings are already ablaze. Uh, here's Stroop reviewing his troops, and a radio command post uh, that allowed Stroop to communicate uh, to those he needed to communicate to. <coughs> the resistance fighters were hunkered down in bunkers. Uh, it might have been as many as 600 bunkers that had been built. Um, by the Warsaw ghetto residents. Uh, this was a scene of a typical bunker. Uh, here's another one. And this one you see a resistance fighter um, down even lower. Uh, another bunker. So they were hiding out in the bunkers. Uh, they were sniping as best they could at German soldiers. Uh, of course, this was doomed to failure. Every resistance fighter knew that. They knew that it wasn't, they weren't going to succeed, but <coughs> it was uh, symbolically, it meant a great deal. Yeah? Did the Germans take those pictures? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure did. Yeah. So this was taken by German, by, by German you know, documentary teams that just followed right along with Stroop soldiers. Okay? Just traipsed right along with them and took photographs of the entire uh, raising of the ghetto. And this is what the raising of the ghetto looked like. Building by building, apartment by apartment, brick by brick, every building in the ghetto. The place was ablaze. Uh, clearly could be seen uh, by people beyond the wall. By Polish resident, by Polish citizens. Smoke, fire pouring out of windows. That's just one day after another, routing out the resistance fighters. Sometimes rounding them, rounding them up, and marching them to the Umschlag Platz for shipment to Treblinka. Other times, just shooting them on the spot. <clears throat> Here's a picture taken on the other side, okay, the Polish side of the wall, uh, with uh, smoke pouring out of, a, out of a ghetto building. This is the destruction of the ghetto. And of course, thousands of people. So you see a set of pictures now of men Fighters leaping to their death, trying to escape uh, escape the uh, the fires, the smoke, uh, or just simply opting for suicide. And here's a man falling from an upper window. Uh, another picture here. Um, a woman. Uh, many of the resistance fighters were women. Many of them, as you're going to see here in some upcoming photos. Okay. People who had leapt to their death on the sidewalk. SS soldiers in the foreground. And then a, a series of pictures of people who were captured. And of course this picture, I'm sure some of you will recognize this picture. as a very famous picture, very iconic picture. Um, we really do not know who the little boy is. Nobody knows for certain. But that's a that's a pretty powerful image. Resistance fighters, men and women both lined up against a wall to be searched for weapons. So what happens to these folks is one of two things. Uh, they're either marched to the trains and shipped off to Treblinka, or they're simply shot. 
It's an interesting picture. Uh, three women who have been captured. Uh, the woman who's kind of cut in half on the far left, she perishes at Treblinka, as is the woman who's in the center. But miraculously, <coughs> the woman on our right uh, survived the war. Fighters who have been captured. This too is one of the one of the really somewhat famous pictures of the Warsaw Revolt. I've got two photographs here that were taken within just seconds of one another. This is this is one of resistance fighters who surrendered and are being marched, and then this is a little closer up picture. It's not the same one, uh, but. Gives you an, we know who the people are in this photograph. They've been identified. Uh, and the two women in the front and the little girl and the man over the left shoulder of the center woman uh, were all members of the same family. Yeah, I, this strikes me as a very poignant picture. These are resistance fighters being pulled out of a, out of a bunker. One of the many hundreds of bunkers. And I guess it doesn't need much emphasis to say that, you know, that strikes me, maybe you two, is this picture of the man and the, and the woman over here on the left that are holding one another. These are SS soldiers in the background. These people have just been pulled out of a bunker. And here is a shot of. People being marched to the train station to be deported, and you see the the ghetto is ablaze, smoke, fire everywhere. Coming out of a bunker, another shot. Now, to see the destruction, the physical destruction of the ghetto begins to take a little shape in this photograph. You see the rubble, the bombed out buildings, uh, the destruction. Here's a woman and a couple of men who were in custody. And another couple of resistance fighters. And then another small group. So what you're looking at is what was given to Himmler by Jürgen's troop as evidence of what they had done in Warsaw. And the reports are that uh, Heinrich Himmler was very satisfied uh, when he saw the, the evidence of how the ghetto was no more. Fighters who have been killed. Uh, these are Ukrainian soldiers uh, who were working with the SS in conjunction with the SS. So they're, they're there. And they're looking at the bodies of the deceased resistance fighters. And the, yes, please. Wait, wait, wait. I was wondering, how did they find some of these bunkers? Because with that much destruction, and then some of the buildings were blown up, it looked like they were still able to go into some of those dugouts. How were they able to find some of those hidden bunkers, or if people were alive in them? They, they just went down the street and, and looked into every building, every nook, every cranny, every hole. Um, and even at that, you know, they didn't find everybody. Um, but it was just a systematic, just literally room by room by room. You know, every building, every bunker, until you just dragged everybody out, or almost everybody. I didn't see any dogs, so I just wondered how did they actually find some of it. There were plenty of dogs. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I we maybe don't have any pictures, pictures of them, but there were plenty of dogs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. there were plenty of dogs, and um, you know, you, um, you fire into the bunkers. Uh, you have flamethrowers that shoot down into the bunkers. Um, and so there's, there's ways of chasing the people out. 
And some of those pictures are staged because they had they had uh, vicious dogs when they were getting on the trains. Yeah. By this time, the, the ghetto had been depopulated, or were people still in the buildings while they were People were still in the buildings. I mean, non combat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah with, with, the, with the population, after the big action, the great action, uh, with about 50 to 55,000 people who were uh, in the ghetto. You really only had, in total, about 600 to 700 armed resistance mm -hmm. fires. So only a small percentage of ghetto residents. Uh, what was the objective of the resistance? I mean, was they, were, were they going to stop the, the, uh, the, the, the loading of people? In no. The no, they knew they weren't going to stop the loading of, of people. Uh, but literally... Uh, the fighters said, you know, we get to, we control our own destiny now. We will determine the circumstances, the situation, the timing of our deaths. We're not going, we're going to, we're going to put up resistance and we're going to fight back. They're going to kill us. With that, 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 that was inevitable. Was there coordination between the two groups? There was. There was coordination and then there were ideological differences between the two groups as well. Uh, the Zob faction, the younger faction, um, many uh, of those fighters uh, had Marxist leanings. Um, in the Jewish uh, combat, uh, in the military union, rather, uh, that organization, the ZZW, uh, they they didn't share the kind of left-leaning outlook that uh, that the Zob fighters had. But in in the end, there was at least some measure of coordination, and just that, you know, they didn't have too much to coordinate with. There just wasn't a whole lot. Um, ZZW maintained some contacts with the Polish underground outside of the ghetto, uh, but even that was very limited uh, and, and very sketchy. Some other street scenes here. Um, that's what the ghetto looked like. Whoops, Daisy. Let's go. Where did, where did the remaining population go? Hmm. Or, or was there any remaining population? Um, let me just go down through all of this. Where did the remaining population go? Yeah, right. Or was there any left? Not the end. Not the end. Okay, let's. You've seen these. I don't know what our computer is doing here to us. We caught back up to where we were. Okay, the aftermath. Bombed out buildings. And here we go. And with this, the uh, that's the the dome of the great synagogue. Mm -hmm. And that was blowing up. Uh, it became the last act of uh, Nazi aggression against the uh, Jews. And Is there Stroop, anything, is there anything left of the huh? Is there anything left of the synagogue? No. I'll show you what sits on the side of the old of the great synagogue in just a little bit. Oops. Okay, let's go here. But this is how Stroop defined what he did. Um, after prolonging the suspense for a moment, I shouted Heil Hitler and pressed the button. Uh, with a thunderous, deafening bang and a rainbow burst of colors, the fiery explosion soared toward the clouds. An unforgettable tribute to our triumph over the Jews. The Warsaw Ghetto is no more. And at the war's end, okay, this shot was taken in the spring of 1945, that's what the ghetto was. And of course, Warsaw itself was almost bombed, uh, totally out of existence. Uh, Hitler unleashed the, uh, the German uh, bombardment against Warsaw, and 97% of buildings in Warsaw were destroyed in the latter days of the war. 
Warsaw has been rebuilt today. Uh, and if you go there, uh, you might be struck by what a remarkably modern looking uh, city it is, although many of the buildings have been rebuilt according to their original architectural designs. So you're looking at buildings that you think were built in the 1800s sometime or the early 1900s, and they're all post-war. They're all post-war, but they look like, you know, their original buildings. So, Same thing in Berlin. Berlin is a modern so here's the toll. Uh, it's estimated that around 13,000 were killed during the uprising. Uh, half of that number uh, died from smoke inhalation or were burned alive. Uh, of the 50,000 roughly that remained in the ghetto, uh, they were all shipped to Treblinka or Majdanek, uh, most of them to Treblinka, and of course, uh, all of them were killed. I, although I should say the revolt in Treblinka happens after this. So some of the resistance fighters who survive um, the battle in Warsaw, when they are sent to Treblinka, they participate in the revolt in Treblinka. And out of that number, about a hundred maybe uh, lived to the end of the war. And there were thousands that participated in the revolt at Treblinka, but uh, the ones who actually escaped, uh, about four to five hundred of them, most of them were rounded up and killed by, by the Germans. So, in one of his last letters out of Mila 18, this is what Anna Levitt said, wrote a letter to a friend and said, my life's dream has now been realized. Jewish self-defense in the ghetto is now an accomplished fact. I have been witness to the magnificent, heroic struggle of the Jewish fighters. And I think that captures, in part, the, the essence of the revolt, knowing that they were doomed, knowing that they were going to leave a legacy, uh, very important. This was the largest revolt by Jews during World War II. Okay? It was larger than the revolt at Treblinka, larger than the revolt at Sobibor, or the many, many other smaller, isolated revolts uh, across Eastern Europe. Our Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. has marked this simply by saying well, this is one of the most significant occurrences in the history of the Jewish people. And in fact, April 19th, uh, the day for the start of the revolt, is a national uh, memorial day in Israel now. And uh, it's very, very famous. The revolt at Treblinka, or excuse me, the revolt in, in the ghetto uh, was the subject of uh, John Hershey's uh, novel, The Wall, uh, featured in Leon Uris' novel, Mila 18, and more recently in Roland Polanski's <coughs> film, The Pianist. Mm -hmm. So in the years that follow, okay, this is a shot a picture that was taken in the summer after the fighting in Europe had stopped, when VE Day had been realized. Okay? The man on the far left here is named Sincha Rodem. Okay? And that's a picture that of him with some other mostly unidentifiable women. We don't know if they were resistance fighters that had survived, but he certainly was. And I'll come back to Mr. Rodem in just a second. This is a picture of uh, Jürgen Strut, the SS commander. Uh, he was tried uh, in a Dachau uh, U.S. military tribunal and was sentenced to death. And then four years later, uh, we did the American military didn't uh, execute him. Then, even though he was under sentence of death, and then the Poles uh, put him on trial in a Polish court and sentenced him to death and hanged him the next year, March of 1952. This is called the genuflection of Warsaw. When Willie Brandt was the, uh, uh, the chancellor for West Germany in 1970, he made a very important visit Poland, and he was at Warsaw, 
and he's gathered at this memorial to the fighters, the resistance fighters. And he goes there, and everybody thought that he would give a talk, share some words of wisdom and insight, and instead he fell to his knees. I didn't say anything. So this becomes a very, a very, the Warsaw genuflection, a very famous picture. And as Brandt observed, and they stood on the edge of Germany's historical abyss, feeling the burden of millions of murders, I did what people do when war is failed. <coughs> that is what sits on the site <laughs> of where the great synagogue was. That life, that it, it's a blue building. No one across Warsaw and then many other parts of Poland is the blue skyscraper. What's the name on the top? MetLife. Insurance. This is the uh, bunker memorial at Mila 18, where Annie Levitz and the other Zob uh, fighters committed suicide, about two dozen of them, as the SS was closing in on them. Uh, and this is what Treblinka looks like today. Um, as I said, Treblinka is, is pretty darn remote. Uh, but this big marker in the middle here stands where the crematorium was. And you see these stone markers around this? Uh, there's about 18,000 of those stone markers. Very few of them have any words on them. Uh, although one of the most prominent that does have some writing on it is Janusz Korsak. Uh, a marker in honor of Korsak and the children of the refuge. But most don't have any wording on them. And there's two possible explanations as to why there's 18,000 of these stone markers at Treblinka scattered around like that. One is that that is probably about the total number of villages, towns, cities, places where the victims of Treblinka came from. Might have numbered as many as 18,000 different places. Uh, the other explanation is that when Treblinka was operating at full capacity, they could execute 18,000 people a day. <coughs> and <coughs> Central Road, last surviving fighter dies at age 94. You see the date on his death? It's two weeks ago. You know, I, I, I share this with my students, that we take an event like the Holocaust, and we want to relegate it to ancient history. <laughs> we want to say, oh, well, that was a long time ago and in a different place. The last ghetto fighter just died two weeks ago. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. That's why, you know, to come back to this event that Howie has helped establish, that's why it's so important that we learn and we remember so that it doesn't happen again. And that's it. Thank you. It's another Holocaust a year after the war ended in Poland. In Poland, yeah. So when you say it'll never happen again, one year after they killed how many people in the Holocaust? Six um, million Jews? Six million and Jews and 11 million in total. It happened one year after. Yeah. One year after. Yeah. And of course, we've had other genocides in Cambodia, mm -hmm. in Rwanda. Correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you something about that name. Simcha in, in Hebrew means a happier, joyous and uh, 18, the numerical value of 18 in Judaism means life, I brought it in. Uh, so, and any derivative of, uh, you know, 1,880, 1,800, 18,000, mm -hmm. you can still do right. right. It means life right. for, for, for the two letters that make up. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a quick uh, truth like a story. I went with the Human Rights Group three years ago at Christmas time. Um, I'll be going back to Poland again this coming Christmas. Um, this group travels to the extermination camps and a couple other places uh, between 18 December and 30 December. So you're not home for Christmas. 
and you go at that time of the year and keep your fingers crossed that the weather is cold and nasty and cloudy and dark. Uh, I was at Treblinka. We had about 20 students with us, and one girl was dressed in a, in a red jacket. And she wandered off where all those stones were in that area. She wandered off by herself, and she positioned herself looking into the forest and didn't move for five minutes, for 10 minutes. And so I talked to my friend, Dr. Rick Halpern, who, who kind of coordinates these trips. And I said, Rick, you think one of us ought to go over and tap her on the shoulder and see if she's OK? And he said, no. I've seen this before. Leave her alone. And after another couple of minutes, looked up again, and she was back with her student colleagues. And I guess that story it struck me that these are very powerful, very moving experiences to actually go to the places and put your feet on the ground where these atrocities took place. And they impact people in a variety of different ways. I don't know what that girl was thinking or what she was processing. You can all imagine all sorts of scenarios for her. But there was something about her needing to just separate momentarily, stare into the forest, and uh, then return. So, it's been a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Thank you. Uh, Thank a you good time. Much. I appreciate your coming. Uh, Learn and Remember is a powerful set of, uh, of events, and we thank you, Howie, for, for your leadership on this. And so, um, any other any questions or comments? Aren't the, uh, some of these right-wing political parties in Europe are uh, re-emerging? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Poland. It's certainly the case. Uh, yeah. France. France. All over. Yeah. yeah. So, right here at home. Well, you know, the right here at home thing is kind of interesting because we, uh, when taking students on these trips, have found that you don't have to do a lot of explaining. And while the parallels don't work perfectly, or some would say don't work easily at all. Uh, but still, uh, the nationalist movement that is occurring in the Western world, the United States included, uh, it's interesting how quickly students pick up on this kind of stuff and say, yeah, yeah, I get it. I see it too. So, other questions or thoughts? Well, I said to myself, I'm going to keep this to one hour. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the clock, and I think we succeeded. Mm -hmm. so.